questions go. So we'll take that as it comes. Um, at this point in time, I would like to um, welcome Wendy Molesdale, to, who, run, who is going to be running this particular webinar for us. Um, Wendy is a nurse practitioner at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre in the NICU. She is also the education lead for Pregnancy and Infant Loss Network, now a part of Sunnybrook's Women and Babies program. During Wendy's 30-year career, she has journeyed with far too many families as they experience infant loss in the NICU setting. Wendy's passion and commitment to the area of bereavement led her to join Pale Network, then PBSO, as a volunteer in 2010. When she became the lead for education in 2014, she completely revised the one-day education program and the Compassionate Care Workshop was created based on evidence-based information from current Canadian literature and leaders in the field around the world. Wendy and her education faculty have traveled around the province of Ontario and to Newfoundland to provide the CCW to over 600 people since May 2014. She also contributed to the content development of the Pregnancy and Infant Loss Perennial Education Key Messages, which is one of the main reasons why I invited her to join us today. In addition, her other passions include singing in a choir, flying a Cessna, and traveling. So based on that background, I'm sure she'll have no problem managing this webinar with us. So thank you very much for joining us, Wendy, and I'll let you take the helm. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. To review the objectives for this afternoon, you can see them on your screen there. We're going to talk firstly about pregnancy and infant loss and just go over the most current knowledge on that area. Then we'll also review the pregnancy and infant loss prenatal education key messages. And most importantly, we're going to talk about how to introduce and teach the, these potential topics in a prenatal class setting, whether or not we should, and how, and very most importantly, is how to best reach out to those who may need our help. Also, we're going to share today some communication strategies, and I hope that can be something that's a part of the discussion towards the end, and certainly I'll be going over strategies in the presentation. And I'm assuming that the majority of participants today are at least familiar with the key messages and or the supporting evidence that can be seen at the website on the slide. My own philosophy is here on the screen and most importantly inclusivity. So you'll hear that various terms will be used throughout the webinar as I describe the role of parent or childbearing woman, etc. Secondly, I also acknowledge that in society today, across various cultures, there are various forms of families and the vital role that family-centered care plays as we interact with families who are bereaved or who have not experienced that sort of a loss. Also important is the use of mindfulness and self-reflection. How well do we know ourselves as we are providing education and support to others? Let's frame the beginning of the conversation by looking at some Canadian statistics. As many as one in five pregnancies will end in miscarriage. There's a range in the literature from 15 and then even as high as 25% as there are great variations across this province and across this country. Unfortunately, approximately eight babies are stillborn every day. That's from Statistics Canada 2013. Pregnancy terminations are on the rise in the last decade, and that's most likely related to the increasing sophistication and availability of antenatal screening and advanced tests, the inclusion of fetal echocardiography, for example, quite readily as soon as there is any abnormality on a fetal anatomy scan. Even the introduction into normal practice of the fetal anatomy scan and the depth of that particular ultrasound gives us more and more information about the fetus in utero. Approximately five babies die each day as well within their first year of life. In the United Kingdom, just to give you a reference point, they estimate that 11 babies are born still every day. Currently, the UK, with full support of their federal government, are in a 15-year campaign which began in 2015 
to reduce stillbirths by 50% by the year 2030. That's quite a high mark set to be achieved, and they have many different programs and ideas that are underway currently. One in four is not just a statistic, it's me. When you look at the entire experience of pregnancy and infant loss, it is actually one in four women who experience this. And that's a key part of the webinar today, to increase awareness and to begin the conversation or to carry it further about pregnancy and infant loss. Because at, at times, I would suggest many times, it still feels awkward to us. And it's only awkward because society does not acknowledge death and loss. We generally feel a degree of comfort when we talk about the death of a grandparent or an adult, perhaps even our spouse, but not when a baby dies or a miscarriage has happened. Why would society feel that the death of a baby is something you can, quote, get over? When our parent dies, no one tells us to get over it and have another. So the reality in Ontario, statistics from, again, Stats Canada for 2011, fetal deaths numbered 3.1 per day, or 1,132 in that year alone. And I think it's quite telling to see that 41% of all fetal deaths in Canada occurred in our province in that year. So we must appreciate how frequent this is. It is certainly all too common, yet we do not talk about it. Pale Network data from 2015 estimated that approximately 37,000 families in our province in 2014 experienced the loss of a pregnancy or the death of their infant up to one year of age. Those were a lot of families that are needing to be accepted and supported and validated in their loss. From a social point of view, then, there's a lack of awareness. And that might be due to a lack of knowledge. But even if we have knowledge and awareness, it doesn't mean we understand. I think what drives us most in this moment is there's a fear of the emotional response we will receive when we ask the questions. Pale Network, amongst others, has worked hard to increase awareness both to the public and to healthcare providers in every discipline across this province. We'll discuss that more in depth later. So the reality is that provision of care, no matter what the setting, may be more driven by task and have an impersonal sense to it and lacking compassion when a family or a woman alone is experiencing pregnancy loss. There's avoidance of the issue itself and that can lead to avoidance of the person in that moment instead of engagement with that person and support and compassion. One argument a person may put forward is it, but we have increasing workload. I would counter that that does not exclude compassion and caring in our work. Key concepts for discussing pregnancy and infant loss and for this webinar is that a loss equals a loss equals a loss. A pregnancy loss at eight weeks is no less of a loss than the term stillbirth or neonatal death. But unfortunately, we do hear these comparisons quite frequently. And even from the lips of one bereaved mother to another who might state that a loss at eight weeks is nothing compared to mine at full term. A blog I read recently called this concept of grief comparison and how painful this can actually be, especially between two women who have experienced a pregnancy or infant loss. So no loss is greater than another, and we cannot estimate the magnitude of the loss for the individual. 
I would suggest that even a couple in a relationship might not realize the magnitude of the loss for each other individually and the magnitude of the loss for the family. Certainly we do not know the full story of the current pregnancy when we encounter women and their families in a prenatal class setting. We frequently do not know their journey and what it took for them to become pregnant and to be sitting with us in the classroom. Attachment. Attachment is not related to the length of gestation. Again, attachment is a concept that's very individualized. Parents have more opportunities now than ever before to see the baby in real time. They have stronger bonds to the baby, perhaps perhaps related to that very technology. You can even watch a baby on live video in the womb. Or family members who are not present in the room can Skype or FaceTime into the room from hundreds of miles away to be there at that first ultrasound or to be there at the gender reveal. So technology may actually be playing a role in advancing or enriching attachment earlier than ever before. Certainly couples or women are attached to the very idea of a life with children in it. If they are planning to have children in their, in their future, they're already thinking about it and the implications, the bigger house, what about daycare, the need to buy a minivan. These things are already in their minds perhaps before they get pregnant. Grief is universal. We grieve because we have loved. What is more individualized is how we mourn the loss. Across cultures, within cultures, and between any two individuals, the way we mourn a loss is individualized. Grief is universal. So grief is the internal experience of the loss the thoughts and the feelings about the loss that you experience generally within yourself. While mourning, mourning is individual and is an outward expression of that grief. Crying, talking, how we have special ceremonies that might honor the lost baby. Anniversary dates, some couples choose to have, especially on the first anniversary of the loss, they choose to have a remembrance ceremony, perhaps a releasing of doves or balloons or, or some way to commemorate that they continue to remember and always will. There are also cultural and religious rituals, and these are all particular ways of mourning a loss. I really admire and, and respect the writings of the rabbi, Dr. Earl Grohlman, who is with the Hospices of America. I would encourage you to read some of his blogs and some of his writings through that website. Grief is real because loss is real. I particularly like this quote, grief is not a disease. It is as natural as eating when you're hungry, drinking when you're thirsty, and sleeping when you're tired. We need to remove the taboo that surrounds death and dying and grief. So now we're going to move into a, a brief description of types of pregnancy loss to try to highlight some of the differences in these experiences. And especially as these individuals may be coming to prenatal classes with this history. So miscarriage is the death of the fetus within the womb, resulting in a spontaneous loss before a 20 weeks gestation. In the U.S., one HMO estimates that up to 70% of miscarriages are occurring in their ER settings. One challenge, of course, amongst many, many challenges in that setting, how many emergency rooms have a scale to weigh a baby who may have been born at around 20 weeks? What if the woman isn't exactly sure of her gestational age. How many babies then are actually not a miscarriage but classified as a stillbirth in actuality because they are greater than 500 grams? 
why does this matter, this talk of a statistic and weighing a baby? It, it does influence statistics, and statistics help us acquire funding so that we can provide support and educational programs to healthcare providers, so they are all intertwined. Also, if the baby is born at greater than 20 weeks gestational age or greater than 500 grams, the parents are required to arrange for burial or disposition of the baby's body, whereas below 20 weeks gestational age, the family may choose to take the baby or may leave it at the hospital to be incinerated with other tissues and medical waste. Next is ectopic pregnancy. I was surprised that it occurs as often as it does, one in 50 pregnancies. We hear most often about the fallopian tube being the site, which is the most common, but in fact it may be anywhere outside of the uterine cavity. And of course, if it is implanted in the fallopian tube, a woman has a great risk of losing the function and or losing the tube related to the sac rupturing, so it may well impact her fertility. The young woman who comes into the emergency room with severe abdominal pain, she may or not, may not be conscious, she may or may not have known she was pregnant. So imagine the scenario where she is taken to the operating room in an emergency scenario, only to awaken in the recovery room to learn that not only has she had emergency surgery, but she was pregnant and the baby has died and she is now only with one fallopian tube instead of two. So there's huge ramifications of this experience. In terms of stillbirth, this is the death of the fetus after 20 weeks gestation and or weighing more than 500 grams that occurs prior to the completed birth or extraction from the mother. The challenge here is the definition of stillbirth differs around the world. And this makes it complicated to compare one jurisdiction to another. For example, in Canada, greater than 20 weeks gestation is defined as a stillbirth, whereas in some of the US states, it's greater than 22 weeks or greater than 24 weeks. And when you look at the World Health Organization data, they have tried to streamline things into greater than 28 weeks gestation being the definition to try to compare it's interesting to note that 98% of the world's 2.5 million stillbirths occur in low-income countries. We are considered in Canada, the US, and the UK, for example, to be high-income countries. So we only have the burden of 2% of the world's stillbirths. However, that is still a great number. Investigations after loss. So it is, of course, recommended for women to have a full medical evaluation after a miscarriage. But a couple of caveats about that is that some women may not know that they were pregnant at all. Perhaps they haven't had any changes to their body, and then they have a period that's heavier than usual. So that sort of situation would mean that that miscarriage is not counted. Some may also choose to not disclose their previous miscarriage or miscarriages to their healthcare provider or even to their partner. Perhaps it's a new partner that they have had that prior loss. So there's another influence upon gathering of statistics. While it's also important to have that medical evaluation, it's very important for psychological follow-up as well. And that is a key component of the post-miscarriage medical care. So from a medical standpoint, we need to ensure there's been full expulsion of the fetus and the tissues, that there's no retained products, so an ultrasound and a blood test can help with that determination. But also individualized from one woman to another is the degree of bleeding, the length of the bleeding time, and the associated pain. Unfortunately, the pain that women are experiencing as they are miscarrying is often underplayed and they do not have anticipatory guidance about this when they are sent home from the emergency room to experience the miscarriage at home in their bathroom. A 
really important aspect about miscarriage that's highlighted in the literature in a couple of articles by Randa Limbo and, and Catherine Cobbler in the US. They repeated a study, one in the early 90s and then the date there, 2010. They wanted to interview women about their experience of miscarriage. So they found in, in both of their studies that 75% of women when interviewed at approximately 10 weeks post miscarriage, 75% of them viewed it as the loss of a baby, while 25% viewed it as a life experience, not causing sadness or feelings of loss. This is very important to highlight to an expectant couple. So they're aware that not everyone will experience a miscarriage the same way, even between the couple. There might be that the father is completely devastated by the miscarriage while the mother is able to move forward and view it as a life experience. Whichever way they feel about their miscarriage, it's still vital for women and their partners to have compassionate care and to be offered the same opportunities as possible to see and touch and hold their baby. As I previously mentioned, a great deal of miscarriages do occur in the emergency room where their, their need for attention may not be because of a physical emergency, but I would entertain it's most definitely for many an emotional emergency. So investigations after a stillbirth are generally more likely so perhaps not for those at mid-gestation as much as those experienced at term gestation. Unexplained stillbirth, when we hear that phrase, we really should think about perhaps it's unexplored stillbirth. Because was there placental pathology done? Was there genetic screening either during the pregnancy or samples taken from the baby after being born still? Was there a full or a partial autopsy? Had there been a thorough review of medical and pregnancy history? Was there antenatal care and was it adequate? Was there adequate fetal surveillance? These are things that the SOGC would, would discuss in, in their writings on the possible causes of stillbirth, as you see listed on your screen. Of course, a challenge in any setting, certainly in the geography of Ontario, we know that outside of major urban centres, there are fewer available resources to fully investigate a stillbirth. And even between medical practitioners, there may be differing degrees of investigation that they would pursue based on what they feel is the cause for the stillbirth. So neonatal death is the death of a newborn infant up to 28 days of life. A caveat about the NICU environment is even though that baby might be day 98 when they die, they are most likely still below 40 weeks or below 44 weeks actually corrected. So they are still classified as well as a neonatal death in terms of statistics. If a baby dies in the NICU, the family will very often be approached about autopsy in order to help them in the future to know if there is a genetic cause for the death or if something can be prevented or something can be followed more closely in the next pregnancy. Rarely the coroner will be called to review. What actually happens frequently is if the staff physician has any doubt, he or she will actually call the coroner and inquire by reviewing the case over the phone to see what they actually think. And then the last type of pregnancy loss would be the medical or therapeutic abortion, which is a medical procedure performed to terminate a pregnancy, and that's either due to a life-limiting fetal diagnosis or when continuing the pregnancy itself is a threat to maternal health. A special circumstance that we see more and more is the death of a multiple. I say that we're seeing it more and more because women who are now having pregnancies later in their life are more prone to spontaneous multiple gestation or through pregnancy and reproductive health assistance. 
So the death of a multiple may happen at any point in the pregnancy, but usually early to mid-gestation. There may be intrauterine fetal demise for any number of causes, or selective reduction may be indicated. That might be for a congenital anomaly, anomaly excuse me, that is deemed to be life-limiting, or for the safety and survival of the other infant where one is not growing or has a condition such as twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome that may actually threaten the survival of the other baby. Or we see more now that if there are spontaneous higher order multiples or ones that are induced by reproductive technology, the couple are often counseled to reduce to twins. And I would suggest that this is a pregnancy loss even if the twins themselves survive. The couple will always know that at one point there were more babies inside her womb. So that should be something we keep in mind that they may be experiencing feelings of loss and sadness related to that. Also, there may be selective reduction in higher order multiples when there are maternal health concerns and sometimes even the reduction of twins to a singleton for that reason. So within the NICU, unfortunately, it's not all that uncommon that one twin survives the NICU course and the other does not. There are also circumstances when the deceased twin is still carried in utero until the other twin is born at a gestation for viability to be possible or even closer to term. These circumstances are individually assessed. But these parents struggle with many emotions and you can see them listed there on this screen. Guilt that they feel they should be mourning the death of one baby, but at the same time, they want to be happy that one is alive, but then they feel that guilt of not feeling sad. They may feel ambivalent, and they may show this by not engaging in the life of the surviving twins. Perhaps this is a protective measure, especially in the case of premature twins where the second baby may also be just as fragile and have a risk of death. And they are act the parents are actually waiting to see if they are going to have one funeral for both of them and wait. So similarly, they're afraid. They're afraid of attaching to the living baby because what if that baby too should die? They want to celebrate the living baby, though. They want to feel some happiness and joy. And relatives and friends may unfortunately say things which are trying to be encouraging, but they might say, at least you have this one, which isn't easy for the parents to hear and is, is likely not meant in a hurtful way. And then finally, resentment. Perhaps now they're resenting other couples who have multiples who have twins, they may be resenting that they're now in a singleton prenatal class and not the special one or a special one that could be offered in their community for multiple births. Medical or therapeutic abortion. I had previously mentioned this, but I wanted to highlight the emerging field of perinatal hospice where a couple may choose if offered the choice or if they are aware of the choice, that they wish to carry their baby as long as possible until natural labor happens and they can give birth at a time when they choose, as long as the mother's health is not threatened. They may choose perinatal hospice. We see in social media postings and stories about women and their partners who do choose this. One story I saw in social media about two years ago now was a family who had a bucket list. They were planning to be a family of four and they were going to do a whole list of things around the world. So when they learned that their second child had a life-limiting diagnosis and would not survive outside the womb, the four of them, so the couple and their daughter and the baby in, in, the, in the womb, if you like, did those bucket list items and posted on Facebook as they traveled and accomplished those things that were very meaningful for that family. The Pediatric Advanced Care Team at SickKids, the PACS team, um, is a special, specialized team who oversee cases that are palliative and they are 
people that we turn to as well from Sunnybrook when we have this situation and, and they can give the families choices about hospice. This has become a very meaningful element of our care to be able to offer choice, to be able to offer to the parent that they can make these decisions, that they can in fact parent this baby in a way that they would choose with our support. The second bullet on the slide, I wished to clarify that generally when we talk about pregnancy and infant loss, we are not referring to circumstances when child protective services have apprehended an infant at birth and thereby the couple or the individual has experienced the loss of this infant. I do acknowledge that that would be an extremely difficult situation. So let's come back for a moment to stigma. I know that there have been recent webinars looking at the stigma surrounding mental health and especially mental health in pregnancy and after. So certainly this is very relevant to today's conversation. In society today, there's a fear of death and a fear of loss and pain. Capitalism means to be productive, to achieve. And we don't want to be viewed by others as being unsuccessful. There's a fear of being viewed as a failure in a role that we choose, a failure to cope, a fear of being viewed as weak, a fear of the loss of status or standing in a community or in a cultural group. These things all contribute to the silence that surrounds pregnancy and infant loss. To a degree, unfortunately, in my opinion, miscarriage is viewed as normal because everyone knows someone who has had a miscarriage. But this removes the perspective of that person experiencing the loss. We see it from the outside rather than from their perspective. I feel it dehumanizes pregnancy loss, leaves the woman who has experienced it alone and unsupported and unacknowledged in her grief. So the impact of pregnancy and infant loss, I'll refer first to the childbearing woman. Um, she has feelings of failure, that herself has failed, her body has failed her, and that the world has failed her. And the world has failed her really in both directions, that you know, the assumptive world that things are fair and good things happen to good people, that she can't figure out why this is happening to me and to my body. I did everything right. I ate the right foods. I got good amounts of sleep. I even took naps. I didn't lift anything heavy. Why am I experiencing the loss of my baby? She may also feel that her body is no longer or maybe never has been a safe place if she has had multiple miscarriages. So you can imagine how this contributes to her feelings of low self-esteem and a shattered body image and questioning of her own self-worth. She's also potentially questioning whether or not she can mother existing children or is she even worthy of being a mother to any future children. There is a significant struggle to find meaning, to find a sense of place in a world that you didn't know you were going to be in. Stillmothers.com is a, a website for women who have not born a living child and will never be able to, either due to physical or perhaps psychological reasons. So the cloak of invisibility, I read this just the other day, it really struck with me that no one can see that she is a mother. She doesn't have living children around her. She appears young, but society does not recognize that she is indeed a mother, but a mother to a baby born still. I encourage you to read more on that topic. From the viewpoint of the partner or the father or the co-parent, he or she is also feeling like a failure, that perhaps all those questions starting with perhaps, perhaps if I had supported my partner more, perhaps if we hadn't gone on that long walk. You can imagine the rationalization that's going on in someone's mind. They feel unable to have protected their loved one from harm and from the pain, which can bring them great 
guilt, and great emotional and physical pain. They feel out of control because a situation like this has no control. They may feel fear and guilt, anger and confusion. Society still raises boys to be men who are the strong one in the leader role. Perhaps the partner feels guilt because the pregnancy not it was not what he or she desired at this time in their relationship. So perhaps they're feeling guilty that this thought ever entered their mind at all. In focusing on, on the partner's grief here for a moment, we know that the focus is often on the birth mother. How is she feeling, both emotionally, her pain? Is she sleeping okay? But the focus on the birth mother may mean that the partner's grief and feelings in fact, their needs are being overlooked and unacknowledged. So as, as healthcare providers and, and, and prenatal educators, we can have a definite role in making sure that the partner is not overlooked. The partner may feel anxiety about admitting any fears or upset feelings because they don't want to burden the mother with any more. They don't want to give her more to deal with at this time. They wish to try to lighten the load for her. Often the partner is the communicator or the storyteller. And I suggest this could be a burden or it could be a privilege. With social media and texting and emailing and phone calls, who is the one that's returning all these calls and texts to say this is what happened? So this could be extremely challenging and put an extra burden upon the partner and actually the couple may choose to designate somebody who is close to them, a friend or a family member, to be the one who fields the calls, especially in the early days. We know from the literature that fathers have been studied. We haven't got much uh, research about same-sex families and their experience of pregnancy and infant loss, but fathers who have been studied, we know that they have a greater tendency towards using alcohol and addictive substances to dull the pain of losing their son or daughter. In terms of perinatal bereavement then and looking at the couple and the family together, certainly pregnancy and infant loss is most often quite unexpected, so there can be shock and trauma associated. Um, some families, some individuals do experience post-traumatic stress disorder related to this. Bonds, the emotional bonds, sometimes this word is used interchangeably with attachment. Bonds begin for most early on in the pregnancy, especially for the woman carrying the baby, as she can feel the flutterings and see the differences in her body. And as well as the loss of, of the baby, there's the loss of the role of as being a parent, a parent to a living child, and the anticipated place in society of raising a child. There may be serious interpartum or postpartum complications that may mean there's a loss of the ability to carry a pregnancy to term in the near future. There is definitely a lack of concrete or tangible memories for this couple or for this woman. There are either none or very few life experiences with the baby, depending on when the loss has occurred. Especially if the baby has died in utero, it might be that there's only the ultrasound images as, as something that the couple can hang on to. With the advent of smartphones, Many are choosing to record the heartbeat when they do hear it at that first ultrasound. And then unfortunately that might become the only thing that they have. Realize that if there's been a dilatation and evacuation procedure in the OR setting, that that will mean in most cases that the family does not get to see the baby. When we offer to create memories, and we're going to go into this a little bit more in a few minutes, but we must ask permission. And we need to be very aware of cultural beliefs and cultural values. A key way to frame it is that we must never assume that something 
would be wanted by a couple just because we think in our own lives that it would be meaningful to us. All activities must be framed around cultural and religious values. We must always ask the couple what might be meaningful in this difficult situation. The last thing I put there on the list is about cooling devices. So these are, are being talked about more and more in the baby loss community. Cooling devices, there's one called a cuddle cot, which actually is, if you can think of a Moses basket style or a, some people call them a, a, a joey bed, that's one company, that you can actually put cool water that is running through a mattress or cool air that's blowing upon the baby, this can lengthen the time that the parents can have with the baby after the birth. Lack of social recognition can definitely be a, a very important factor here that if, again, if, if the loss is early or even if it's mid-gestation, parents may not have shared the news of the pregnancy in their social circle. And then society has this 12-week mark, this line in the sand about when is it safe to tell. So I think, again, as healthcare providers and prenatal educators, just our role in interacting with expectant couples, it's, it's really important for us to try to break down that old habit. One woman that I work with said, you know, as soon as I'm pregnant, I'm telling all of you. And a few people kind of laughed. And she said, well, you know, if I lose this baby, who do you think I'm turning to for support? So I already began to discuss on the last slide about multiple losses which may ensue when there is the loss of a pregnancy or the loss of an infant after birth. So the the parent has lost their role as parent to a living baby. They will always be a parent to the baby that has died, but they aren't going to be a parent to a living baby. There's the loss of place in the parenting community. And also for children and grandparents, we need to remember them in our care of these families. A sibling may worry that they somehow caused the death. They may worry that the death or the perceived illness of the baby could happen to them. So it's important to sit down with that sibling and not exclude them from the experience, but to actually sit with them and figure out by talking to them, what, what do you understand about what's going on? And to actually, you know, be frank with them, because in many cases that young child is very aware of what is happening. And then for a grandparent, I would suggest that oftentimes grandparents don't have peers who have also gone through the experience of losing a grandchild, or if they have that experience, because it's more common than we think, their peer group might never have chosen to talk about it, because when they were young people, society definitely did not talk about it. So just to remember the grandparents as well. Some say in the literature that they're experiencing a double burden. They are grieving and very upset for their child who is bearing this loss, but then they also have the loss of their grandchild. So the uniqueness of pregnancy and infant loss, it's death at the beginning of life, and this is unique. Please remember that healthcare providers may be amongst the only people who have ever met that baby and known the baby or held the baby. And this is something very, very special to the couple. If loss is later in the gestation when a woman's body has changed, she will face many questions from others that will be difficult to answer. I've heard many women talk about the difficulty of leaving the house, that they feel that they cannot bear to be asked say, in a grocery lineup about, oh, when is your baby due? So instead, they choose social isolation. So some of it is self-imposed social isolation, but I would argue that some of it is also what we have imposed upon her by not supporting her, not embracing her. 
as we would if it had been an adult that had died instead. So what are we doing to raise awareness in this province? We are very grateful to uh, Mike Cole, MPP for Eglinton Lawrence, who in the fall of 2015 brought forward a private member's bill, Bill 141, the Pregnancy and Infant Loss Research Care and Support Act. He brought this forward out of personal experience of loss through his own daughter. Bill 141 also established October 15th as Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Day. Coming from the passage of bill into law on December the 8th, 2015, was then a need to lobby the Ontario government about funding for the bill because the bill had set forward that things needed to change, education and research and more and more support for families was needed across the entire province, not just localized to larger urban centres. So members of Pale Network and Mike Cole's community and the baby loss community rallied around and attended every single one of the finance committee's community meetings around the province to establish and secure funding for the bill. And that meant that Pregnancy and Infant Loss Network would then be moved under the umbrella of Sunnybrook through their Women and Babies program in order for the mandate and the funding to be enacted. So that transition has started as of January 1st and as you can imagine is a highly complex process. So we're working now towards a national approach to support, to raise support and awareness by lobbying our federal MPs. Ontario is fortunate that there is already such a strong baby loss community and community of support, both through Pale Network and through Bereaved Families of Ontario and the Bereavement Ontario Network. Other provinces don't have the degree of support and structure set up, especially in terms of infant loss. The first summit on pregnancy and infant loss was hosted uh, on May the 16th at Mount Sinai. And it says there we're planning a follow-up event for the spring, but actually it's more likely to be the fall now. So we are working very, very hard to break down the walls of silence surrounding pregnancy and infant loss, but it takes all of us to be brave enough and compassionate enough to truly break down those walls. Because we don't talk about it, especially how common pregnancy and infant loss is, when we do start to discuss it or we're confronted by it, we're uncomfortable and we feel awkward. For example, when someone brings it up in prenatal class, what do we say? We need to prepare ourselves to talk about it. We need to move forward from previous approaches and previous social norms, and we need to break down the walls. Pregnancy and Infant Loss Network then under the mandate or under the umbrella now of Sunnybrook set forward in January and February to travel to four, uh, 14 communities around the province over a 10-week period to ask the very questions about what do bereaved families and parents and healthcare providers, what do they need? What do they feel are the key priorities for Pale Network going forward? They heard time and time again from over 600 people that more education for healthcare providers is the most important thing. Also, more public awareness. Some of the communities that were visited that are more remote than the big centers are Sioux Lookout, Manitoulin Island, and Dryden. So just a quick word about Pregnancy and Infant Loss Network. It did start as a Canadian charity back in 1992, so 25 years ago. I just did that math this morning. Uh, founded by four bereaved parents who unfortunately, but in a way fortunately, had their losses at the same time at the Hospital for Sick Children in the NICU. And they were literally leaving the building after knowing each other in that setting. And they had found nothing to help them as they left and they wondered why there wasn't anything. So they undertook to create Perinatal Bereavement Services Ontario. 
so PBSO. But then I think really importantly, the members asked to change this name. Actually, it wasn't 2010, excuse me, it was 2012 because they literally made a, a very important point to us. They said, you know, when I'm in the depths of despair and grief, in the darkest time of my life, I don't know what perinatal means. I don't know what bereavement even means. All I know is that I need help and I want to find some help for, for myself and my partner about pregnancy loss or infant loss. So those are the sorts of names that I would want to search on the internet. So we uh, changed the name in response to that request. So Pale Network has two mandates, to provide free peer-led support to bereaved parents and to educate healthcare providers. So in terms of the free peer-led support services, it's currently a self-referral process, so the individual bereaved parent needs to refer themselves. Um, and again, we are aiming to change that into an automatic referral process with consent after a pilot project is likely conducted this year. We foresee it to be similar to the consent process for Healthy Babies, Healthy Children, that the couple would be consented by a healthcare provider before they leave the hospital setting, that somebody would, for example, contact them in the next week to see how they're doing. Currently, there's more than 27 peer-led groups across Ontario that meet either every other week or in some areas it's once a month. We have an intake coordinator that will respond to the request for help within, really within 24 hours, but definitely before 48 hours of the, of the request. Support can take many forms. It doesn't have to be the small group meeting. Many will express early in their journey that they're not ready for that. They're not yet ready to hear other people's stories or hear other people's pain because they're still trying to come to terms with their own. So there can be support by phone calls and email. There can be one-to-one -one matching, for example, for a particular type of loss or if there's a grandparent who is needing support, then Pale Network can facilitate that sort of support. And then what we see, which I feel is such an incredible gift back, is that many parents choose to then become a peer facilitator because they are so thankful that somebody has supported them and they want everybody to have that opportunity to be supported. Educating healthcare providers and community partners around the province has been a great um, privilege and pleasure of mine over the past four years or so. Uh, we have presented an evidence-based eight-hour workshop around the province highlighting Canadian research literature. It's an interactive workshop with small group activity, as well as opportunities to make hand and foot molds, for example. We do emphasize mindfulness and self-reflection. And I think really importantly, we do talk about caring for the caregivers, because as we go through these experiences in our work life, and then we go home, you know, who is, who is caring for us? Who is helping us? face this day after day or to face this year upon year? How do we help each other? How do we support each other? So also as part of the workshop, there's the memory making. So that includes photography, um, videos. We virtually in the NICU ch setting choose anything that we can get our hands on that relates to the baby. We try to create a meaningful memory box for the parents, and we ask them about what would be meaningful to them. Perhaps in their cultural, cultural background, there's a certain ritual or a certain process or blessing that would be meaningful to them, so we try to support them in every way we can. One funeral home director said to me in Sudbury that as long as it's not illegal, I'm going to do it for them. The highlight of our day at the Compassionate Care Workshop is definitely the parent panel. This is in the later afternoon when anywhere from two to four parents will come and actually share their stories. I think this is a very brave and wonderful thing that they do. Our participants tell us that this is very meaningful and helps to really drive home the message. So let's talk for a few minutes now about communication do's and don'ts. 
they're all displayed there on the screen, but let's talk a little bit more about, about some of them. Listening more than you talk. Again, if we think about society today, there's a great desire to fill the silence. There's a great desire to not have that silence. We want to make sure that we're saying something because maybe that silence will be too uncomfortable. So listen more than you talk. Acknowledge their loss and their feelings. I think as we're talking about this, you can even think of this in terms of, of being in that prenatal class or being individually with them you know, before the class starts and they have disclosed to you that they've had a loss. So by acknowledging their loss and their feelings, their loss is validated. Give them permission to grieve their baby. Ask them their baby's name. This is very important. So many people that I've met around the province had said to me that their biggest fear is that nobody will be speaking their na baby's name aloud, that nobody will remember their baby after they're gone. So by all means, ask them their baby's name. Ask them to share their story if they wish. This, of course, will be highly individualized. Answer questions they have, or if you don't know the answer, it's okay to say that. Show genuine caring. Actively listen. So active listening is about taking note of more than just the words that they're saying, but noticing the body language, noticing the relationship between, if there's a partner with the woman, to notice the interaction with the partner and the partner back to the woman. See the woman's affect her body posture as she is talking to you. And by all means, contact them when you say you will. If you say to them that you're going to call them tomorrow to see how they're doing after the class, make sure you follow through on that. So it can be very validating to them that we think that their story matters to us, that their baby matters and is worthy of being remembered, worthy of being cherished, and woven into the family story. Okay, some communication don'ts. Don't dominate the conversation. That ties right back to listening more than you talk. Let them say what they need to say. When there's a pause, just wait for the pause to run its course and see if the partner may speak up and say something in that pause. Don't use cliches. She's in a better place. When that sort of cliche is spoken, a woman or mother or partner may feel that, but what better place could there be than in my arms, than in our family now? Or the cliche, you're young, you can have another. Again, we don't know the context of the current pregnancy. We don't know what it took for them to be pregnant. God needed another angel in heaven. That cliche is loaded with assumptions. We assume they believe in God. We assume that they see their baby as an angel. We assume that they believe in heaven. Don't pass judgment. Again, we can never know the shoes they're walking in. We can never know fully about their life, even if they've shared things with us, perhaps over previous classes. We still don't know the fullness of their experience before we met them. Don't change the subject. This is an awkward, potentially awkward moment. It's difficult to have this conversation, but don't change the subject. Don't give medical advice without knowledge. Don't forget the disenfranchised mourners. So remember, that means that their grief has not been acknowledged, has not been recognized. A story that I think illustrates this well is a young woman who has epilepsy, and she is pregnant with her son, and she has a grand mal seizure. And unfortunately, she slips into a coma. So she is hospitalized. She is somewhere around 18 or 19 weeks gestation. She's in the hospital for several weeks and then unfortunately does miscarry. 
she remains in a coma and the doctors aren't sure whether or not she's going to survive. She miscarries her son at 22 weeks. And again, the husband and the family don't know if this lady is going, you know, their, their loved one is going to wake up or not from her coma. So they have a funeral service for the baby and the baby's cremated. And then about five weeks later, she does wake up. But she wakes up and her world is completely shattered. She finds out she's lost her baby and she finds out that the baby's cremated and there's been a service. This woman's at very high risk for disenfranchised grief. And I would suggest even complicated grief. Don't take anger personally and don't generalize about pregnancy and infant loss because every single situation is highly unique. Any phrase or saying that begins with at least is likely not the best thing to say. At least you never really knew her. At least you know you can get pregnant. At least you have other children at home to love. All of these statements really devalue the existence of the baby that was lost. And one last at least that I heard when I taught in Northern Ontario and it will stick with me forever for how unpleasant it is, at least you didn't gain all that pregnancy weight. So subsequent pregnancy, I'd like to suggest that those who attend prenatal classes who have suffered a loss are in fact in their subsequent pregnancy, but we won't know which one. They might have had several losses before, or this might be their first pregnancy after loss. Some data there for you. Um, after perinatal loss, the majority of women become pregnant again, 50% within a year of the loss, 80% within 18 months. This involves so very careful counseling to women and their partners about planning. I hear many, many times that healthcare providers will say to wait, you know, two to three months and then try again. But if you've had a full term stillbirth, that will mean that the anniversary date of the loss is very, very close to now the due date for the current pregnancy. So again, that's that anticipatory guidance that we can offer to a couple. Some people will in fact choose that because they want that time of deep grief and loss to now have a happy experience with it. But um, I, I think again, anticipatory guidance can help a couple understand about how long to wait. <coughs> Excuse me. So women in their subsequent pregnancy, they experience or perceive a lack of support from others and report feeling that their experiences are misunderstood and minimized. People don't understand why they're so anxious, why they want to have an ultrasound maybe even twice a week. They don't understand why they can't just relax. Oops, sorry, I skipped the slide. Let me go back. There we go. Many women experience isolation from their normal support networks because even their closest friends or other couples just don't understand what they're living through. And you can see that there's a lot of literature in this area. There's uncertainty about returning to the same care providers or not, which depending on your geographic or, or resource availability, you know, might shape whether the couple can have choice or not. Some will want to deliver at the same hospital in the same room because again, they want to change that life experience into now being something positive. Again, it's important we don't assume what couples want. It's important that we ask them. Research tells us that mothers in the subsequent pregnancy have increased anxiety, but they have similar levels of optimism that things will be all right this time. Fathers have significant anxiety and PTSD during the pregnancy but these symptoms are quickly reduced after the birth of a live baby. And in the study by Turton et al, fathers had greater anxiety when the subsequent pregnancy after a stillbirth was delayed. 
so people in their subsequent pregnancy were not again to assume what they want or what they need so it's best for the caregiving team to ask do they wish to have personalized prenatal classes or do they want to go to a group class because they want some quote normal close quote aspects to the situation again we can provide them with their options and let them know what the pros and cons of each choice might be People in a subsequent pregnancy will benefit greatly from consistency in their caregiving team with ready access in many ways by email, texting, phone calls, more frequent appointments for sure, more frequent ultrasounds. It's also very helpful to have the same ultrasound technologist so that the woman or woman and her partner don't need to explain things every single time. Some are sent home now with a fetal heart rate Doppler device. This is quite controversial because this, is this really reassuring or can this lead to a lot of false alarms or stress? All of these things are likely best coordinated by a subsequent pregnancy clinic. And that again is one of the mandates of uh, Pregnancy and Infant Loss Network now under the umbrella of Sunnybrook to be um, offering a model of care for this sort of clinic around the province. So the prenatal class situation, I can honestly say to you all today, those of you who are prenatal educators and are involved with prenatal teaching, you know better than I the degree of challenging situations. You know that you need to prepare for the unexpected. So come into that teaching moment with mindfulness. Be open and be without judgment to whatever may be shared in that classroom. And as you can probably tell me, there's quite unpredictable, unpredictable classes, I'm sure. We are in the best position to provide compassionate and knowledgeable and informed support to bereaved women and their families. We are in the best place to dispel myths to address rumors and clarify concerns better than many others. So in order to facilitate your role in the prenatal class setting, we can all benefit from practicing self-reflection before we're in that moment or after as you debrief within your own mind how things have gone. We should know our own feelings about pregnancy and infant loss and be educated about current methods of support, about current statistics, so that we can be reassuring or we can provide facts as needed. We should reflect on our own experiences with death and with loss because this will definitely impact how we approach and understand others' experiences. So what to do when or if someone shares or states their loss in the class? Should there be a class where it is it, pregnancy and infant loss, is deliberately discussed? Is there a way to be open and acknowledging from the start? So what to do when or if someone shares or states their loss? I don't have the answers. I know you probably wish that I did. It does depend on the situation and the reason the person has decided to disclose their loss or begin to share their story. It might be that this is the first time that they have publicly said anything. It can be an extremely difficult moment, even if they are expressing their story with anger. As the prenatal educator for that class, it's going to be up to you to make a decision in the moment. You could say, I'm sorry for your loss. I'm sad that you had that experience. Would you like to share your story? Would you like to chat with me more at the break? Should there be a class where it is deliberately discussed? And again, this is more in your experience than mine, but I wonder if there's a way to introduce a discussion about special circumstances after the break 
where you would give a heads up to participants and they could choose whether they stayed or whether they left. Perhaps we could frame it around a talk about subsequent pregnancy because that way we're automatically talking about prior pregnancy loss. We know from the literature that having special classes or one-on-one -on -one prenatal education for those in their subsequent pregnancy after loss is something we know about. But again, as I alluded to earlier, some couples may be wanting to be included in that, quote, normal pregnancy experience and are seeking that this time. A colleague at Sunnybrook uh, recently shared this with me that the way she opens her classes is to acknowledge to participants the many paths that all have taken to arrive at this moment or this place in your lives here in the class and that you may not all be here with your first birth experience or first pregnancy. So let's discuss it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Wendy. This has been uh, quite enlightening. And I think, although we probably would wish there was more information about how to manage these sorts of situations in our prenatal classes, I think having the information that you gave us in the background really does help us prepare more for those sorts of situations. Uh, before we go further, I just wanted to draw attention back to, you had mentioned something about the cooling beds, and one of our uh, participants was asking if you could go a little bit more into detail about that, because she missed some of it because the line cut yeah. out. Sure, I'd be happy to. So um, the cooling beds, right now there seems to be very limited um, choice out there on the market, but there's one that's very popular in the baby loss community called the Cuddle Cot. And this is from the UK. Um, a lot of uh, groups within the baby loss community are actually doing you know, crowdfunding and specialized fundraising in order to purchase Cuddle Cots for hospitals. So if you can picture your typical basket weave Moses bed, that's the sort of place where you would put the cuddle cot. So the cuddle cot itself is two different methods. One is actually a cool air blowing device that when the baby is lying, say, in the Moses basket in the parent room, the air is actually blowing from a series of little channels around the baby in an oval, if you can picture that and it actually blows cool air on the baby. At our bereavement committee at Sunnybrook, when we heard about cuddle cots, we thought, well, we don't need those because the baby's gonna be in the arms of a parent or the arms of a grandparent. The baby's gonna be held. But then we had a couple of mothers point out to us and enlighten us that a cuddle cot would have permitted them to have more time with their baby because the cuddle cot, the cooling device can slow down to a degree the beginnings of decomposition of the baby's body, it particularly skin decomposition, which as you know, at, at the time of being born still, it could already be in various stages of maceration. The other type, the type from the UK, is actually a mattress. Um, it's blue, it's a rectangle, and it has channels where distilled water that is cooled from a motoring device at one end, um, the cool water runs through the mattress and the baby you know, can be put down and kept cool maybe while the mom rests or when family members leave the room that the, the baby is still there. That's great, thank you Wendy uh, for that explanation. I would like to invite um, all of you listening in, if you have any specific questions that you would like to ask um, to Wendy, um, it would be a great idea if you would enter those into the chat box and we'll go through them one by one. And I know sometimes it takes a little while to, chat to, uh, to actually type those in. So I think uh, while you're doing that, I'm just going to pose a question to Wendy that's sort of been on my mind. Um, you mentioned you were talking about, you know, should we have a particular class where we talk about that. Um, I'm not even thinking so much about that as much as I'm thinking about you know, if you're in a class and you've got a group, and especially if you've had an evening group where you met them more than once, whereas the weekend ones, you don't really get to know them as easily. Um, how do you approach, when we're talking about breaking down the walls, how do we approach talking about infant loss 
as a topic in our classes um, that, that cannot be threatening. And as you said, you know, you want to make sure that you're not giving people an, an option to leave the class if they're not comfortable. But if we're not going to talk about it, then we're going to keep having those walls up. So where in our prenatal classes would it be a good time to introduce this? And, and how much do we talk about? How little? It's, it's so difficult to know. Do you have any, any tips? Well, again, there's no easy answer. But if there are several classes where the same group of people are going to be together and not the Saturday style where it's the one full day. So perhaps you could do it. I would suggest towards the end of the full day or towards the last class. Because we hear time and time again about if it's so common, why did nobody tell me about it? Mm -hmm. And we hear these words from people who have experienced the birth of a, of a still baby or have had a miscarriage, and they just don't understand why, why everybody expects them to just go back to work next week and get over it, basically. It isn't easy, but I think if you have built up a relationship with these couples or parents as they've been in your class for a couple of sessions, I, I think it's important and we need to start feeling less awkward about it. We will very sensitively, I would suggest, introduce it and let them know that it's a difficult discussion. And again, I would have it after the break so that a couple could make a choice. They could make an informed choice. And again, I think to frame it, you could introduce it by introducing the concept of a subsequent pregnancy because potentially there are people in the room who might not have mentioned that this isn't their first birth or their first pregnancy. Right. Okay, thank you. Now we have a couple of questions coming in. So Rebecca asks if there are any cultural insights. Um, I'll let you deal with that question first before we go to the next one. And that's probably a loaded question. <laughs> I can see the next question, Rebecca. <laughs> wow. Okay, these are really important. We could have a whole webinar on each of these. So cultural insights. We certainly in the bigger urban centers in Toronto have, and, and the bigger centers in the province have quite a degree of, of multiculturalism. I think speaking from a healthcare provider perspective, we have a great fear that we don't know everything about every culture and oh my gosh, we should be competent or at the very minimum we should be sensitive about cultural differences. So I think the first step is to have sensitivity and awareness that not everyone in every culture will experience death or honor the death of a baby in the same way. So I, I don't mean to sound flippant at all, but I feel it's always best to ask the couple in your culture or in your ethnic group or in your family, what would be the most meaningful, you, meaningful for you right now? Are there special or traditional practices that you would like to undertake. Certainly if the couple can't think of anything because they're most likely extremely upset, you could ask family members that might be there with them. Or if you have experienced other rituals or experienced supporting a couple in a bereavement before, I like to use the phrase that some parents have found this helpful. And then I describe it. Or that some parents have chosen to take their baby outside into the sunshine because they want their baby to feel the warmth of the sun on their skin. So the healthcare provider can be a resource for suggestions, but it's always important to leave the opening that they can ask or they could they can um, ask maybe they're gonna ask their family, maybe they're gonna ask their elders, because if they've never encountered this before, they might not really know what is to be done, but they might need some time to speak with their elders or with, with a religious um, member of their community to give them guidance about what might be done. And Rebecca, you also ask about comments of dealing with teen moms. That is a huge challenge and I assume you mean when they're experiencing pregnancy and infant loss. Um, certainly that a huge challenge because not only is this person a young woman or perhaps 
a, a teen, so perhaps even you, you could say she's a child and she's experiencing pregnancy loss, we need to know developmentally what age they're truly at, what sort of support system is around them. I, I think they're at high risk of disenfranchised or complicated grief because they most likely are losing friends because of the pregnancy or you know, some friends might stick by them, but they might have lost the benefit or the support of their social circle. We know that teens turn the most to their peers for support. They don't turn to adults for support when they're stressed and they're needy. And women using substances during pregnancy, can you expand a bit more about what you mean about that? So if you can address that, I'll move on to Kim. What are some education opportunities? Ah, so uh, Kim, so now that Pregnancy and Infant Loss Network has moved under the umbrella of Sunnybrook, in these first three months of 2017, everything is being moved over from a charity situation to a healthcare organization situation and everything is being rebranded and updated. So just watch um, for announcements via um, the Facebook page and via the Sunnybrook uh, page. When you go to palenetwork.ca, it will automatically now link you to the Sunnybrook page. So just keep your eyes to that. We hope within the next couple of months that we're going to announce the schedule of our compassionate care workshops. So Rebecca now is clarifying about her question about women using substances during pregnancy, how to support them when they have a loss and the guilt. Oh. oh, Rebecca, that's a very complicated situation. I would say that they're most likely going to need support beyond the healthcare provider, that they're going to be at higher risk of complicated grief, and they're going to need the support of professional counselors or therapists as well certainly being compassionate and understanding towards them as they struggle through these feelings in the early hours and days after the loss. Again, to actively listen and to be compassionate towards them and not passing any judgment because for sure they're passing more than ample judgment upon themselves and their family members might also be blaming them and lashing out at them that it's their fault. So we have time for one or two more questions. So if you have any more questions, um, please feel free to um, to add a, a, um, a, a another question in the chat box. And thank you, Sam, for just putting up my an actual link instead of just putting <laughs> into network.ca. I thought I was being clever. Um, but um, we have a few more minutes for questions. So feel free to um, to add any more questions that you may have right now for Wendy. Uh, we've tried to focus as much as we can on the prenatal education side of, um, of this topic, but of course I think for, for most of us, we may not actually encounter directly in our prenatal classes, but it's about being prepared so when we do actually run into it that we have that background information. So just as a reminder, on the, um, on the website um, for the uh, prenatal education key messages, there is the resources and links section does guide you through a large number of different types of resources that are available. Um, so for example, if you're looking for any kinds of um, guidelines that are out there that have been written, that would be in the guidelines section. If you're looking for resources for yourself, they're listed in that section, and resources for, um, for your clients that you might be dealing with. Now I see Ashling's put a uh, question here about special advice for fertility and IVF nurses dealing with early losses um, and how you would counsel those, those patients because of course in that situation mm -hmm. you've become quite um, accustomed to those people coming in and out of your clinic and you know them fairly well mm -hmm. and then if they end up getting pregnant and then dealing with a loss, I can see how that would be a very challenging situation which is different from being in a prenatal class but you're still in an educational position. So what would you uh, suggest for that? Again, that's a very challenging situation, and I know I didn't, I didn't touch on that in the webinar today, but certainly women or couples experiencing fertility issues, they've already likely had one or several losses before the time that we encounter them. And for our 
same-sex couples, they are already coming to the clinic to become pregnant in the first place. But I could suggest that there might be lots or several instances of loss in their lives leading up to this moment. So I can only underscore to be compassionate and understanding and to resist the urge to use cliches to, to actively listen to the couple, to ask them about how they're feeling. Is there any way or anything that we can do specifically for them? We may be, again, be able to provide anticipatory guidance to them by relating generally what other couples or other women have experienced in coming to the clinic. When they have experienced a loss, what, what has been beneficial for them. Again, referring them to Pale Network uh, intake for support would be really important and, and then we would, our intake coordinator would pair them up with other women or couples who've had similar losses. Right. Thank you. Um, I think I would have time for one more question if there is one. I don't see anyone typing right now. Um, so, and I see that we're starting to get some drop off right now as people are starting to leave the webinar. So perhaps this will be a good place to, uh, to end the webinar. And I'd like to thank you, Wendy, for sharing your wealth of information with us. It's really fantastic to know that um, although Pale was very effective as a charity, it's, uh, it's nice to see that they're now going to get hopefully a little bit more funding um, so that they can be more effective in what they do. And I would encourage all of you to visit the Pale uh, Network um, website and also to revisit the Pale Education Key Messages for Ontario on the Pale topic to give you some background information to help you in your prenatal classes. I will be sending out an evaluation um, invitation shortly after this uh, webinar, so hopefully you'll have a chance to let us know what you thought of this webinar. And um, I hope that we will see you in some of our future webinars as well. So thank you very much for your participation, and thank you very much, Wendy, for your, for your, um, for your support in, uh, in doing this webinar. And Angie is writing a little note here. I'm just going to, before we end up closing this, oh, there we go. Thank you so much for uh, giving us that feedback, Cherish. And Angie, I think, is probably going to say something very similar. So for all of you who are still on the line, we'll be uh, ending the phone line shortly, and we'll be closing this, um, this webinar in a few minutes. Thank you so much, everyone. And if, again, uh, we've got your contact information for Wendy here at the top here. There's her email address there. And if you have any questions for me, I'm happy to answer those as well. Thank you so much, and have a great rest of the day. The leader has disconnected. The conference will be terminated in five minutes.